Good afternoon. My name is Robert Laney. Our normal uh, practice for the annual Kelly Lecture at the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation has been to invite a person of distinguished accomplishment from outside our organization to address to us his or her considered thoughts and advice on humanity's future. This year, we saw no need to look outside our organization because the person to deliver this lecture has been obvious to us since she assumed the duties of our new president on August 1st of last year. Our lecturer earned a Bachelor of Science degree with honors from the California Institute of Technology where she studied chemical engineering and prepared her senior thesis under the supervision of Professor Frances Arnold, the first American woman to receive the Nobel Prize in chemistry. Our lecturer then proceeded to Stanford University where she was awarded a pre-doctoral fellowship from the American Heart Association while earning a PhD in Stanford's Department of Biochemistry. Our lecturer currently teaches us as, as a senior lecturer in the Department of Chemistry at Columbia University in the city of New York, where she received the Lenfest Distinguished Faculty Award during the year 2020. Our lecturers work on ascertaining the radiological conditions arising from nuclear weapons testing in the Marshall Islands during the late 1940s and 1950s has been widely recognized in, in the scientific community and elsewhere. When our lecturer assumed the duties of our president last August, she hit the ground running. Among other accomplishments since then, she has spoken on the urgency of nuclear disarmament at various conferences, including memorable, ad memorable addresses to the United Nations General Assembly on August 5th and September 26th. As an accomplished scientist, she has been appointed a member of the United Nations Scientific Advisory Group for the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And she has published various articles and essays in publications such as the U.S. congressional newspaper called The Hill on the urgency of abolishing nuclear, nuclear weapons sooner rather than later. Last month, I received a letter uh, from our lecturer in which she stated the following. The Nuclear Age Peace Foundation was founded with a recognition that peace is an existential imperative of the nuclear age. Forty years later, many remain blissfully unaware of the nuclear threat, while most others have been convinced that it is nothing to worry about. This makes our work all the more critical." Unquote. On that note, it is my honor and privilege, and I admit a large measure of pride, to introduce our, our Kelly Lecturer for 2023 and the President of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, Dr. Ivana Hubes. Thank you, Rob, so very much for that overly kind introduction. And uh, I am really, truly indebted to you and to the rest of our wonderful board, uh, as well as our staff, Carol Warner and Sandy Jones, without whom today's event simply wouldn't be possible. I also want to acknowledge Christian Chiobanu, who is our policy and advocacy coordinator, and is joining us from New York virtually uh, with a rather large uh, virtual audience. Uh, and so we're trying this for the first time. It's the modern world. We can have people here in Santa Barbara, and we can have people joining us from all around the world. And I would be really remiss if I did not um, also acknowledge the late Frank K. Kelly, um, after whom this lecture series is named. Uh, and Frank uh, was, uh, along with our beloved uh, President Emeritus, David Krieger, a co-founder of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, they founded, as, as Rob alluded already, they founded NAPF um, over 40 years ago in 1982 with a clear vision of a world free of nuclear weapons. And at that time, that vision may have even seemed like something impossible, 
uh, uh, this was the height of the Cold War. It was by the year 1986, there were about 70,000 nuclear warheads in the world. Um, today, my goal is to convince you that that vision is not just possible, but it's something that we are going to achieve. Um, I also want to mention one more person here, uh, and that is the late uh, Marshallese politician and diplomat, Tony De Broom. Um, Tony and David were lifelong friends starting in their um, university days at the University of, of Hawaii, and they later went on to together work on the nuclear zero lawsuits which the Marshall Islands filed against nuclear weapon states with the help of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation for the nuclear weapon states failure to disarm uh, as an obligation uh, according to Article 6 of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And I'll talk a little bit about um, these lawsuits, but also the way in which it was actually David and, and Tony that both inspired and enabled some of the work that I'll be talking about, uh, specifically having to do with the Marshall Islands. So um, before I get into my, my, my lecture, I just want to say one thing, which is that some of what I'm going to say today is going to feel uncomfortable and pr perhaps even scary. And even if you have been thinking about these issues for a while, and especially if you haven't been it, it thinking about these issues, um, and what I want to tell, especially to our virtual audience, because I think everybody in the room can see, that my son, my youngest son, uh, my husband Emlyn is here too, our youngest son, um, Nemanja, uh, is here in the room. He's 12 years old, and granted, Nemanja knows more about nuclear weapons than any 12-year-old really should, <laughs> but I would not dream of giving a lecture in which I did not talk about hope and I did not talk about solutions. So I'm, Nemanja is here and he's hearing me and he's going to hold me to account because I have to leave him a world free of nuclear weapons and that's precisely what we're going to do. So um, I want to begin just with a very short interlude into to give us all and put us all on the same page, give us all a sense of scale as to what it is that we're talking about when we talk about nuclear weapons. And so the first thing I want to show you here, and you're all looking at this and going, that's not a nuclear weapons explosion, right? And it's not, and it wasn't. Uh, this was an event that probably many people remember. This took place in April of 1995. It was the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, and what had happened was that a guy named Timothy McVeigh uh, took two and a half tons that's two and a half thousand kilograms, or five and a half thousand pounds, of chemical explosives. He essentially filled a rider truck um, and left it and detonated uh, the explosives. And the explosives destroyed a federal building. This was just an absolutely devastating event. Um, destroyed the federal building, killed 168 people, among whom were 19 children who were uh, in the federal daycare center, and there was damage to dis destruction and damage of about 300 buildings in a 16 block radius. And in those days, dollars, this was nearly 30 years ago, $650 million worth of damage. Why am I telling you all of this? I'm telling you all of this to give you a sense for what nuclear weapons do. Uh, and when we talk about nuclear weapons, we're not talking about chemical explosives, we're talking about a different kind of material. But when people talk about them, we compare, we talk about the energy yield, how powerful the weapons are, as a comparison to the amount of chemical explosives that you would need to produce the same kind of explosion. And so what happened with Hiroshima is that the explosion, the energy yield of the Hiroshima bomb 
was 15 kilotons. That's 15,000 tons. Now, when you compare that back to the Oklahoma City bomb, that is 6,000 times more powerful. So now we see, we see the destruction that the Oklahoma City bomb um, could do and, and the, the deaths um, uh, that it caused. And now, when it's something 6,000 times more powerful, it um, is unsurprising that this kind of an explosion flattened the city and killed on the order of about a thousand people, a uh, hundred, um, more than a hundred thousand people. And so, again, we are. This is now not the use of chemical explosives. Um, this is a fission bomb. Uh, what that means, and this particular bomb was made up of something called uranium-235. And what fission means is we take atomic nuclei, we take atoms, and we essentially split them into two. Um, and in that process, produce the energy. Um, so that's the, the Hiroshima city. And um, we all know that this took place on August 6th of 1945. But by the early 1950s, the United States had started working on um, bombs that were even more powerful than this. And so what we have, um, and this is, and I'll talk more about the consequences of this particular explosion, um, this is the largest um, nuclear test that the U.S. ever conducted. This was done in the Marshall Islands. Um, and this was done, this was a different physical process. So again, Hiroshima was fission, atom splitting, um, this bomb called, this test was called the, uh, the Castle Bravo test, is about atoms coming together, fusing, and releasing energy that way. And this explosion was a thousand times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. This was 15 megatons, so we're not talking about 15 million tons of TNT equivalent or 15 billion kilograms of TNT equivalent. Um, it is absolutely, this is just an absolute monstrosity. And the mushroom cloud that you're looking at in the, in the image was 25 miles high. Right, so absolutely uh, uh, unimaginable. This kind of um, an explosion caused fallout that actually spread all around the world and contaminated essentially the entire world, um, and of course had the most detrimental consequences uh, locally in the Marshall Islands, as, as I'll describe. So now I'm ready to go into the lecture. Uh, so uh, I am going to talk about the past, the present, and the future of nu nuclear weapons. And I'm going to begin with the past. And really what I want to just give you a sense for is the past for Japan and the Marshall Islands, but really just give you a little bit of a sense for some of the hidden past. I like to think of this as the kind of hidden history of what actually took place in, in um, both in, in Japan and in the Marshall Islands. So of course, it wasn't just Hiroshima, it was also Nagasaki. Um, it turns out in Nagasaki, the bomb that was used was also a fission bomb, so again, atom splitting. It was uh, a different fission material called plutonium-239, and the yield of this bomb was a little bit larger. Hiroshima was 15 kilotons. Now, you all know what that means, kilotons. It's comparison to TNT. This was 21 kilotons uh, of TNT. And the number of casualties was actually a little lower than Hiroshima, partly because the city was smaller and, and, and had a smaller population, but partly also because it, um, it's a city that's nestled um, between mountains, and the mountains actually contain some of that damage, some of that destruction. The next thing that I'm going to show you is probably the hardest graph I'm going to show this entire lecture, but it's really important and it's really, really um, part of this, what I like to think of this hidden history. Um, and this is work that, was, that has been championed by Mary Olson. I believe Mary might be on the call virtually with us if she is. Um, hi, Mary, and, and, and thank you for all of your, your amazing work. 
uh, what you're looking at is a graph of risk of can getting cancer based upon age at exposure to radiation. And so what we're seeing here on the x-axis is age at time of exposure. I'm trying to find my mouse. Where is my mouse? In the middle. You see it? See it's funny. I don't see it. Do it again. Down down the it looks like a nap. Okay, it's hard for me to see it. It's okay. I'm going to stay here. So the <coughs> x-axis, right, we're looking at the x-axis. So on the left is age of time of exposure is zero, so just at birth. And then the age um, uh, goes up uh, to the right. And then we're looking at the, at the risk of getting cancer at some point in your life, depending on when you were exposed to this radiation. And I, it, I just really want you to take two lessons away from this. The first lesson is it's pretty obvious that the risk is higher if you were exposed to radiation earlier in life rather than later in life. And that we sort of all kind of intuitively get. We understand that, you know, people put hats on babies and put them under umbrellas and put a lot of sunscreen and so on. So radiation is bad. The younger you are, the, the, the more um, risk of, of getting cancer later in life you would have. What is not as well known is that the risk is actually not equal between males and females. And the females at all ages, um, compared to males, exposure to radiation leads to higher um, cancer rates. So that's that, and I want you to keep this in mind when I later talk about some of these radiation limits and so on. Another thing that I like to think of as part of this um, sort of hidden history of nuclear weapons is that people often think that what happened in Japan was the only time that humans suffered from nuclear weapons, and that is absolutely false. There has been a long legacy of human suffering due to nuclear testing, um, and the nuclear testing really took place essentially all around the planet. So on this map, what you're looking at is all of the places around the planet where testing was conducted. The colors of the circles have to do with what country conducted the tests, and I'll, I'll go through them in, in just a second. Um, and the size of the circle has to do with how large that energy yield, the thing we started um, uh, the lecture with how large of the explosion um, it was. And one of the things that you can see is that um, there was testing done essentially everywhere on the planet except for, for South America, Central America, and South America. So in Africa, we see tests were done by the French in Algeria. Um, in Eurasia, we see the Soviets tested some in Eastern Europe, um, uh, but mostly in Asia. Uh, bulk of the testing was done in Kazakhstan and, and also in the Arctic. The Chinese tested in the deserts of Western China. The US tested in the deserts of the American Southwest. And then I think, and, and the British tested in Australia, also those pink, uh, uh, pink circles. But I think it's fair to say that the lion's share of the testing was conducted in the Pacific. And I just want to uh, highlight three places. So it's Marshall Islands um, here. I'm still looking for that mouse. Marshall Islands on the left, the blue um, circles on the left in the Pacific, and then the Republic of Kiribati, which, where both the US and the United Kingdom tested weapons. And then down south, um, South Pacific, is French Polynesia, where the French tested nuclear weapons. And when you hear stories from all of these different places, and you basically strip them down to kind of the, the basics. You take away some of the local context, some of the details. The stories are all the same. They're stories of decades of suffering. They're stories of maternal 
um, uh, health impacts, birth defects, miscarriages, cancer rates, thyroid cancer. Um, there are stories of, of uh, loss of culture and sustainable practices, and they're simply, simply devastating. So when I talk about the Marshall Islands, I want you to keep in mind that an equivalent lecture could really be given about each and every one of these um, different places. Um, okay, so, so where are the Marshall Islands in the Pacific? Um, I like to think that if you sort of draw a line from the northernmost point of Australia all the way to Hawaii, about halfway there, so just north of the equator and just west of the international date line. And um, this is what the Marshall Islands look like. It's a collection of 29 coral atolls. The map that we're looking at here is about 1,000 miles across. So that's a lot of, a lot of ocean. Um, and in fact, uh, the way that the islands are shown in this um, uh, image is, is a little bit misleading because they're really not islands. They're atolls, that means they're narrow strips of land with lagoons inside. Um, so down here in the south is Madura, which is the uh, capital of the Marshall Islands. And here is a photograph of Madura that I took in May of 2018. And you can just get a sense for how little land there is. Um, and it's, Madura is 25 miles long, but the, the area of land is four square miles. That means that the, the strips are really, really narrow and, and far less than a mile um, across in width. And so what happened in the Marshall Islands is that the United States conducted 67 tests from 1946 to 1958. And in terms of the energy yield, the total energy yield of all of these tests was 110 megatons. That's 110 million tons of TNT. That's the equivalent of 7,000 Hiroshima bombs or 42 million Oklahoma City bombs. That's the equivalent of one, approximately one and a half Hiroshima bombs every single day while the testing went on for 12 years and, and, and six months. So just absolutely um, unimaginable. And I just want to give you a sense for um, uh, the places that where, where the testing was happening and the, the atolls that were affected. The first was Bikini, uh, where the first tests were conducted in 1946, less than one year after the attacks on Japan. Um, and where also the Castle Bravo test took place. The second is um, an atoll called Eniwetok, where testing was also conducted after um, uh, it, it had started in Bikini. And then there are two other atolls that I'd like to highlight, which are Rongelap and Utrecht, where people were living at the time of the tests, and is in particular with that Bravo test, they were exposed to radiation, enormous amounts of radiation from fallout from the Bravo test. This is not to say that other atolls weren't impacted as well, but these are the four that um, the United States has recognized as affected without uh, recognizing that others might be, but it's also the four where we, that we were able to visit um, and make measurements on and, and our choice of where to go and, and um, where to make measurements was very much depending on resources and time and so on. So, but but that's, that's what I want you to, to keep in mind that we're looking at these atolls in the northern part of the Marshall Islands. And here is a list of the tests. I know you can't really see all of them, but essentially, um, there was, I want to just highlight um, two tests. Um, and the first uh, took place in October, end of October of 1952. And all of the tests up until then were actually fairly close to the energy yield, some, some larger, 
um, and one you know, fairly larger, um, but mostly around the energy yields of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. And then there was this huge jump in the energy yield. So it went from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 15 and 21, and then this Ivy Mike is at 10,400 kilotons. So this is, this is when the US made the first hydrogen bomb. And then um, Castle Bravo um, came um, about a year and a half later. And Bravo had the energy yield, as I said before, of 15 megatons or 15,000 kilotons or 1,000 Hiroshima bombs. And the US maintained for many, many years that Bravo was an accident. In fact, this particular document has down here says that the expected yield was six megatons. And so when it ended up being 15 megatons, that was somehow an accident. And that's why people were exposed. But here's just, and this is part of that hidden history theme, here's an, um, a document um, that we were given by by Giff Johnson in the in the Marshall Islands, and, and he had got received it from Bill Graham. This is a declassified um, document from U.S. government um, that came just five days before Bravo. And um, th this is the kind of classified, declassified document where they do something called deletions. So they give you the document, but if there's something in the document they don't like, they delete it. So there's some things obviously missing, and one can't even look and figure out what they are. So in this um, paragraph B here, it basically says maximum possible yield, blah, you know, uh, deleted um, and, and expected yield deleted, right? But it turns out that whoever was doing the deletions didn't realize that in the previous paragraph, they also actually had mentions of the yield. In the previous paragraph, and I'm going to read this for all of you, uh, it was decided that aircraft would be positioned on the basis of a 20 megaton yield, with the exception of two aircraft, which will be positioned on the basis of a 12 megaton yield. Now, you know, to me, I don't think you need a PhD in science to know that 15 is between 12 and 20, um, and um, it should be pre, you know. To me, this really, really strongly suggests that all those years, all those decades of claims of this having been an accident are just, um, are simply false. So that's the past and, and some of the hidden past. I'm going to talk about the present now and um, to, to talk about what the conditions are like in the Marshall Islands today. I just want to acknowledge my husband, Emlyn, who is here in the room uh, with us and who did get me interested in nuclear weapons, period. Um, but the work that I'll be describing was really sort of uh, joint work between us. And this is the two of us. It's an illustration of the two of us at the Bravo Remembrance Day in the Marshall Islands in Majuro back in 2017. And how did we find ourselves there? And that's the, the really interesting part of the story uh, because it all sort of comes together. We were in California in 2014 uh, with a small group of students uh, and um, we wanted the students to learn about what was happening in the nuclear disarmament field. They came down here to Santa Barbara, they met David Krieger, uh, and they learned about the nuclear zero lawsuits and the nuclear zero lawsuits ended up providing inspiration for us to try to figure out what was happening in the Marshall Islands today. So, you know, within no time of um, uh, the students meeting David Krieger, Emlyn actually traveled with the students to Madura and here um, are the four of them with Tony De Broom. And here's a clipping from the Marshall Islands Journal um, saying case prompts students visit. Um, and the students ultimately ended up making a documentary uh, in which um, 
Lori Ashton, who's here in the audience, uh, and who was the lead attorney for the Republic of the Marshall Islands team, um, and an attorney with um, Keller and Rohrbeck, and her husband, uh, Lynn, uh, is here as well, and I'm thrilled to have them here. Uh, Lori ended up being the star of the documentary, uh, and uh, the students did a really nice, really nice job. But while this was happening, and while they were in the Marshall Islands, they met a lot of people, and they learned about a lot about the, the Marshallese legacy. And one of the people they met was Senator Jabon Riklon, who was a very young child in living in Rongelap, the day of Bravo, and he tells this wrenching story of fallout coming from the sky, the kids playing in it like it was snow, and then by evening's time, everybody's uh, skin is peeling off and itching, um, they, their hair is falling out, they're sick, they're vomiting, they all had the entire island population had acute radiation sickness. Um, and because people are today not living in, in Rongelop, um, Emlyn asked, um, whom would you trust to tell you if the islands are safe? And um, Senator said, I don't know. And so we sort of set out to try and figure out what the conditions in the Marshall Islands are like today. And I'm just, uh, we wrote many papers and made lots of different kinds of measurements, but I'm going to try to give you a sense for three specific um, types of measurements. One is called the background gamma radiation. It's a lot of words, but I'm going to explain, explain what they mean. Uh, one is about contamination in the food specifically, and one is about contamination in the soil. And so I'll start with the background gamma radiation. And what we're talking about when we talk about background gamma radiation is how much radiation am I exposed to when I walk around an area. And this happens everywhere, um, and you have some exposure to radiation, and that's natural radiation. Um, if you are in a place like Santa Barbara or New York City at sea level, the radiation coming from outer space is relatively small, but there may be also on continents radiation coming from the bedrock, from naturally occurring um, isotopes in the bedrock. In the Marshall Islands, um, those sources are essentially non-existent, both because it's a, a, a sea level and um, uh, 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 there's also really no bedrock and naturally occurring isotopes. Uh, so what we're seeing there is really all consequence uh, of the nuclear testing. And I'm showing a picture here of a student, a uh, former student at Columbia, Maverick Abella. Um, she was on some of these trips, and uh, this is Maverick playing actually with children in Utrecht. Um, and some of the graphs that you'll be seeing are graphs from Maverick, uh, who is today a, a, a medical student um, at the University of Hawaii. But here's, um, here's some data about what the radiation levels look like in Bikini Island. And so what I'm showing you here is you're seeing all of the little black dots. That means that's a place where we made a measurement. And then you're seeing the colors um, for the island representing different radiation levels. So that's a simulation of radiation levels based upon the measurements that we took. And the colors here are sort of translated into values of external gamma radiation. And what I just have to tell you is that in the United States, if you live near a nuclear power plant, the, the permissible level is 15 milligrams per year. So that's about here in the purple, right? And we see the bikini is not purple, right? Um, in fact, we see that the, the inside uh, the inner parts of the island are at very, very high radiation levels. So I want to just, that, that's bikini. And I want to show you, and I'm not going to go into the details here 
um, because it's complicated and they're different atolls and so on. But I want to show you that when we looked at different islands and different atolls, it wasn't like we just found everything was red or everything was yellow or everything. It was complicated. Some islands had very little um, uh, radiation or, or no radiation that we could tell um, coming from, um, from the, the contamination, and some islands had a lot. So uh, again, just to give you a sense for the, for the complexity. Um, and then the second kind of measurement is the cesium-137 in the food, and this is another student who was involved um, in this work. And in the Marshall Islands, the food, um, the locally grown food are things like coconuts and pandanas and, and breadfruit, and so this is a coconut grove um, on Bikini Island. The reason the cesium-137, so cesium-137 is one of those products of when you take uranium or plutonium and you split it, one of the things that you get is the cesium-137. Cesium-137 in and of itself produces gamma radiation. But here's why the food part is important here for this particular isotope. And it's because cesium is chemically similar to potassium. And you all know, right, that you when you eat bananas, you intake potassium. Um, and, and so what happens is that if cesium is in the soil, the plants take it up like it's potassium, but then also if you eat it, your body takes it up like it's potassium. And then once it's in your body and it's releasing gamma radiation, um, that can be very, very dangerous. And so we looked and found um, cesium-137 levels on different islands and so on. But once we found those levels, we started to look at what does this mean? What's safe? How much cesium-137 would be safe? Or what's the, what, what are some uh, benchmarks to give us a sense for these numbers? And I had one student, um, it was actually Carly in the previous picture, she, she did this whole project of trying to understand what is considered safe in terms of cesium-137. And our results really shocked us because we found that uh, different organizations in different countries had very different levels. So there's this huge range of what's considered permissible. And I'm just gonna highlight a couple of things. So the, the first one here on the left, our limits, and the units here don't matter, but it's becquerels per kilogram. So how much is permissible for different kinds of food according to IPPNWs, the International Physicians for uh, Prevention of Nuclear War, um, an organization that won the, the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for this work in 1985 and with whom we uh, collaborate very closely um, to this day. Um, they recommend a level of eight for infant food and then 16 for everything else. And remember that graph about children being exposed, um, being more, more um, uh, detrimental, so it makes sense to distinguish between the two. And then we have levels determined by Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine, which were all um, impacted by the Chernobyl uh, disaster, and they, I would say, they sort of put infant food at about 40 becquerels per kilogram. And then there's Japan, which um, for infant food and milk is a 50, and for everything else is at 100. And then there's European Union at 370 for infant food and milk and 600 for everything else. And then there are two organizations, the Codex has to do with trading of food and IAEA is the International um, Atomic uh, Energy Agency. They have a thousand for everything, for all different kinds of food. And then there's the, um, the FDA, the US FDA. Absolute winner, 1,200 for everything, including infant food. And I just want to highlight that that's 1,200 is 150 times higher limit 
than IPPNW recommends for infant food, and it's about 30 times higher than Belarus, Russia, um, and Ukraine limits. So absolutely astounding. So just to give you a sense for what we found in the Marshall Islands, we actually translated those limits into colors. So green is actually not violating the Russia, Belarus, and, and Ukraine standard, although it might be violating the IPPNW standard. And then blue is not violating the Japanese standard. Um, yellow is violating the Japanese, but not violating e European Union. And then orange is violating European U Union, but not FDA. And red is violating even that most permissive um, uh, standard of the US FDA. And this is what it looks like for bikini. I think you might have a hard time here um, seeing all of the colors, but I'll just tell you, there were no green fruit on bikini. There were three blue fruits on bikini. Most of them were yellow. That means they violated the Japanese standard. Um, some, several were orange, violated the EU standard, and several were even uh, red violating the US FDA standard. So absolutely our most robust conclusion having to do with the Marshall Islands was that bikini has to be clean before people could live there. Um, and so um, I'll just show you just for the sake of complexity, not for the sake of the details, the last kind of measurement, and this is um, isotopes in the soil, um, and here, we're looking at different isotopes, four graphs for different isotopes. The red is actually bikini, which I just told you had all of the cesium-137 in the food, and those were lower levels in the soil. Um, seems like the, the, maybe the plants took it all up. The green is um, actually an island in Rongelup Atoll. Um, it's called Nyan, um, and it's, um, Rongelap is not where the testing was conducted. So this was an absolute surprise to us. Um, and then this blue here, where a particular isotope is really high, um, is Runit Island, which is where the US um, essentially stored nuclear waste after doing some cleanup in the Marshall Islands. So. Here's the summary. You made it through most of the science. Uh, uh, and the summary is that really that it, it's a what we found was a complex picture. Um, again, our most robust conclusion had to do with bikini and simply saying that between background gamma radiation and cesium-137 in the food, bikini must be cleaned. And it, we talked, was complicated. We found some islands on the, in the south where the US had conducted a cleanup effort to, be ver to, to show no signs of contamination. But it has this ruined dome. That's a whole lecture in and of itself. And then we found some evidence of radiation in the north, uh, northern part of the, the atoll. And then Rongelap, which is close, 100 miles from Bikini, again, where people were living at the time of the Bravo test, we found some good news in Rongelap Island itself. But then there was that Nyan Island, which is in the same atoll, where we found so much contamination that, that was really surprising to us. And finally, um, Utrecht was um, where we did not find evidence of um, uh, contamination today. That doesn't mean that perhaps there, there are other measurements that might uh, point to presence of contamination. And it, of course, doesn't mean that it wasn't there and didn't impact people at the time. But that whole summary, and I, I tried to give you a sort of simple of a picture, but it really is complicated. It was not complicated according to the media, not at all. Um, so there was an LA Times journalist uh, with whom I spoke the day before her article came out, and she asked me for one type of measurement. We had said in the paper that this was higher than in Chernobyl, and she asked me would it be correct to say that um, 
uh, radiation levels in the Marshall Islands are higher than in Chernobyl? And I said, no, it would not be correct to say that. And then when the article appeared, that was the title of the article. Radiation in parts of the Marshall Islands is far higher than Chernobyl, study says. And doesn't say, but the author disagrees. Um, uh, and after that, it was like they just all kept writing the same thing. Newsweek, um, Marshall Islands, where US ran 67, they added more contaminated than Fukushima and Chernobyl. And then CNN, parts. so see here, Marshall Islands, it's like the whole Marshall Islands are more radioactive than Chernobyl, right? Um, and then CNN goes back to parts of the Marshall Islands. Um, and if you think that I'm just being critical of the kind of left-leaning Democratic Party supporting media, um, I'm not. Here's Fox News uh, in on the action saying radiation higher. I don't know how, how you put quotes on higher and what that means, uh, but here they are. And I really honestly never thought I would ever be quoted in an article by Breitbart, but they wrote about this too, and they didn't just write about it, they added a whole thing of their own. They wrote 10 times greater than Chernobyl. That had nothing to do with anything in our, in our studies. But there you have it, complex picture in the Marshall Islands, part of the present, again, the nuclear testing is not just history, it's something these people are living with uh, until today, uh, to this day. And um, what I want to say about the present, what else is part of the present, is the persistence of nuclear weapons in our world. And as I said, around 1982, we were at probably about 60,000 nuclear warheads, went all the way up to 70,000 uh, in 1986, and have been declining. There was a steep decline from that time, then a little slowdown, then it's slow, and now we are definitely in a slowdown and possibly um, in a period of increase. There are about 13,000 nuclear warheads in the world today most of which are more powerful than those Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. From the best we can tell, there is nothing like Bravo anymore in those arsenals, but there are some bombs that are very, very powerful. And so what I want to finish on is the future and really talk about two different kinds of future. One, in which, in which nuclear war happens, and leads to the end of human civilization as we know it, uh, and one in which we actually totally eliminate nuclear weapons and remove that threat uh, from humanity. So the nuclear war future, uh, and I'll say a little bit about the, the chances of nuclear war in just a second, uh, but this is not there's no um, uncertainty that actual nuclear war would cause nuclear winter. And this is something that we have known since around the early 1980s, since around the founding of NAPF. Uh, but what has changed more recently is because there has been so much effort in understanding impacts of climate change, we now have excellent models that can really tell us exactly what these impacts would be like. And so the idea is that if you have nuclear war, what would happen is cities, there would be explosions in cities, these explosions would cause widespread fires, the fires would release soot into the atmosphere, the soot would block incoming sunlight, and temperatures on the Earth would drop very, very significantly. And this would also lead to essentially uh, collapse of agriculture and food availability around the world would be significantly reduced. So I'm going to show you a table from a paper that came out just last August um, 
And we were actually in a side event at the UN where um, uh, Tillman Ruff, whom, who might be on the call today, from the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War, showed these, showed these results. This is work from uh, Lulu Gia and Alan Robach and others at Rutgers. Um, some people at Columbia as well are involved. And I want to point out two scenarios. So what we're looking at in this table is we're looking at um, different scenarios of how much soot would go into the atmosphere under a specific scenario, and that's based on number of weapons and the yield of the weapons. And this scenario is um, seen as a likely scenario for what would happen if India and Pakistan had a regional nuclear war. Um, the number of ca direct fatalities um, from explosions and, and impacts of radiation is estimated to be 127 million people, so that seems pretty, pretty horrible. But the number of people who within less than two years would starve to death would be over two billion. And these numbers, this table actually, is based on a world population of seven billion. We recently passed eight billion. So it would actually likely be far more than two billion. And then the other scenario is where the United States and Russia use one third of their current arsenals um, 360 million direct casualties and over 5 billion, for easily 5.5 billion people st starving to death within uh, the first year or two. Uh, and this is simply, quite simply, the end of human civilization as we know it. This is just not the world in which we can have Kelly lectures and, and, and talk about um, humanity's future. So I was exactly two weeks ago, I was at a high school giving a talk. I was invited by some students. Um, it's called Hunter College High School in New York City. It's a premier high school, public high school. Um, and I was there and, and gave a short talk and met with students and, and so on and so forth. And, I was looking for some news clips, um, you know, for some screenshots from the news to share with the students, and I found this um, about Avril Haines, who turns out what is an alumna of Hunter College High School in New York City, and I, Emlyn and I had actually met her at Columbia and talked to her about the Marshall Islands work. She was really like a lovely person in a small room. But anyway, she recently said that Russia is very unlikely to use a nuclear weapon, and what I said to the students at Hunter College High School, which like many places in New York City, it has multiple floors. I said to them, you know what else is highly unlikely? It is highly unlikely that I'm going to walk out of this building and go down the stairs and fall down and break my leg. And you know, if that happens, it's okay. My life is not over, the world is not over, but highly unlikely for end of human civilization as we know it is just not good enough. It's not good enough and it sh for, for us and it shouldn't be good enough for someone like Avril Haines. They need to know better. They need to be told to, to do better. Uh, it's just not acceptable. So what is acceptable? Well, acceptable is zero. Uh, and that is what the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons can deliver for us. This is a treaty that was negotiated in 2017 by 122 countries, including North Korea. This was a treaty that entered into force in January of 2021. Um, it has currently 68 ratifications, 92 states have signed it. It bans everything having to do with nuclear weapons, but it also includes humanitarian provisions for victim assistance in environmental remediation, which is precisely Marshall Islands is just one example of the kind of place that needs both victim assistance and environmental remediation. So what are we doing? Um, this treaty needs our help. We are working very hard on promoting it. Universalization is the idea that 
um, all countries in the world need to join this treaty, and the, that the more countries that join it, the more pressure there will be on the remaining countries to join as well. And then there's also important work already going on with respect to how you actually implement the treaty. And so um, Christian in particular is very involved um, in the working group on Articles 6 and 7, which are the humanitarian provisions. Um, and as Rob already mentioned, I'm part of the scientific advisory group. Um, and on promoting the treaty, we're doing everything we can. We're writing articles, we're giving statements, we're organizing events, uh, we're doing interviews. We recently wrote letters to all G7 uh, leaders. Uh, we even have responses from Canada. Um, it turns out Canada would really not do well in nuclear winter. They would just, they would start, they would be one of the first ones to start. So it's a good thing for them to, to, to think about this. And we also really put disarmament education and youth at the center uh, of our efforts. We've worked with many other organizations. We um, outreach to um, leaders in Congress, uh, and we are, we are on this. We have to save this world. And so what I really hope is, is, that I have convinced you is not just the nuclear zero is necessary, but the nuclear zero is also possible. So I'm gonna stop here um, and, and uh, take some questions. Questions from Yes, Lisa. Well you hear you know when I we sit at a table with friends or something and bring up the nuclear disarmament and you know it's met with but how you know we can't give up ours because they so is it is there a plan that comes from nuclear disarmament groups that says this is the way this can happen. Obviously, yeah. it's not going to be one country that says yeah. Yeah. we're done. It's got to be step by step. So yeah. Yes, it has to be. Out so people can yeah. Understand yeah. It. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I really do think that the first step, all of these countries, they should sign this treaty. If you sign a treaty as a, as a leader of a country, you essentially signal that you're serious about this issue. You're under no obligations. The obligations come when a country ratifies a treaty. And so the way I think about this is that um, the way it has to begin is with US and Russia um, coming down to a much smaller US and Russia. So I said about 13,000 nuclear warheads in the world today. Uh, of that, uh, US and Russia are over 90%. So US and Russia each have about 6,000 nuclear warheads. They need to come down and they need to come down together. And I really think that for this, what's needed is both leadership at the very top, but, but bottom up, you know, I, I think about it as cut out the middlemen, you know, we need, we need and, and for me the inspiration is really something like the atmospheric test ban treaty, which Kennedy and Khrushchev negotiated. The Senate had no interest in it, but then Kennedy went into this kind of public um, uh, campaign mode, got the general public behind the treaty, and then the Senate ratified 81 to 19. I mean, an absolute success. So US and Russia need to start first, and then it needs to be multilateral negotiations with not just our friends, but with whoever we consider our adversary. I think that anyone who thinks that North Korea is just gonna give up nuclear weapons because we told them to is crazy. North Korea may well give up nuclear weapons if everyone else is giving up nuclear weapons, but they're not gonna give them up if we don't agree to give them up. And then there are all kinds of things, and this is you know, part of, of what even the scientific advisory group is tasked with. How do you verify, how do you, and we have so much technology, and the good thing about nuclear weapons is 
you really can't make them. They're not like a garage project, right? So you're going to know if someone is doing this. And there can be, obviously, inspections and verifications and so on. But it has to be a step-by-step, -step, and it has to be countries coming together. And we need leadership in the world that is actually focused on what's important. The one thing that's very exciting about the treaty is that it was, in many ways, the efforts from the glo the effort of the global south. They looked at things like nuclear winter and said, "Wait a second! Your nuclear weapons could destroy our." countries, even if a, 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 a nuclear bomb never you know, reaches anywhere within our, our borders, or even on our continent. So um, yes, I mean, people are on this, but we do need serious leadership. Um, and we, need, we do need much more public support. The public support question is a difficult one because people also don't want to hear some of this. This is not, it's not like the most fun topic to talk about at the dinner table. But for me, especially as a, as a scientist, but especially as a mother, this is just, this is the most important thing to talk about. So thank you, thank you for that question. Yes? How long does CDM last in Say that? How long does cesium last? In oh, how long? Cesium has a half-life of about 30 years. What that means is when you start with an initial amount 30 years later, it's half of that. Another 30 years is one quarter of the initial amount and so on. It's generally accepted that you need about six to seven half-lives, so probably 200 years. Um, so it's not going to go away quickly. I didn't point out a lot about plutonium, but plutonium stays around for thousands of years, so that's even worse. Um, then there's another isotope, strontium-90, which behaves like calcium, and that we have some evidence of uh, presence in the Marshall Islands, so it's, it's complicated. But yes, it doesn't just go away, yeah. Yes? Um, what about China? And, uh I would think uh, also uh, North Korea and does China have any effect on what North Korea yeah, so China is, you know, in my mind, uh, if there is such a thing, and I don't believe it, it, there is, as a responsible nuclear weapon state, China is about it. Um, and that's because, one, we have 6,000 nuclear warheads. They have about 300 currently. And they also have their nuclear warheads are separated from delivery vehicles. They ha explicitly have something called the no first use policy, that they would never use these weapons first. We do not have that. In fact, no American president since Truman has agreed to have a no first use policy. We have a policy in which we can nuke a country, send thousands of warheads to a country without even being provoked. That's just, that to me is, is just absolutely horrible. So they should all give them up, including China. But the, the responsibility really does lie with the US and Russia right now, just based on the numbers. And in my mind, the responsibility lies with the United States because we are the first country to develop them. We are the only country ever to use them. We wrote the playbook for the nuclear testing era. We essentially told everybody else, oh, well, just go near a vulnerable small population and you know, destroy their lands and, and, and ruin their lives. That, so, you know, if the U.S. wants to be the leader of the world, it should be a leader on nuclear disarmament. That is the place to start. And I'll, and I'll just say one more thing about North Korea, and I commented earlier about, you know, anyone who thinks they're going to give them up without us giving them up is crazy. But nuclear weapons are, and, and this is not an argument that I love, but I'll make it anyway. Nuclear weapons are essentially the only way, I think we should give them up for moral and ethical reasons and all of that, but they're the only way that a country like North Korea, 
relatively small, relatively poor, could destroy our country. They could destroy, they have about 40 to 50 nuclear warheads. They, they do, and, and they could destroy the United States as we know it. And for us not to be leading the way, even out of pure selfish interest, uh, is crazy. It really is crazy. It's absolutely irresponsible. We spend $900 billion on our military budget to be absolutely vulnerable to destruction by a country like North Korea. That's just not good leadership. Yes, How many Jill. people approximately still survive and live in the Marshall Islands? Um, Marshall Islands has an overall population of about 60,000 people, but uh, a lot of people living in the United States nowadays uh, from some of these northern atolls, they were relatively small populations at the time. Um, both in Bikini and Eniwetok, people were moved uh, to make room for the tests and then Rongelap and, and Utrecht. But, you know, in many ways, um, this gets to this this larger issue of who's a victim of, of, for example, nuclear testing. And there are all kinds of definitions, and the U.S. has had some um, compensation programs actually for people in, here, not in the, in the Marshall Islands, that you know, you've got to have a checklist, and you have this cancer, and you have that cancer, and that discounts, and that doesn't count. To me, anyone who was exposed to radiation or is a descendant of, of those directly exposed is a victim, period. This, this is not just about getting cancer. Health is about physical, mental, and social well-being, and these people, all of those, have been impacted. And again, it's not just, just one thing, yeah. So Nancy Martin is asking about uh, the Republic of Kiribati. So both the United States and the United Kingdom tested in uh, Kiribati, in particular on Christmas Island. Um, the total energy yield of those tests was about one third of, of what was done in the Marshall Islands, which is still a lot. Um, if I remember correctly, about 2,500 Hiroshima bombs. Um, so, and, and the thing about Kiribati is there's very little, there's been very little work done to investigate the radiological conditions. It's really, it's really a, 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 a you know, both, both tragic and just a, a huge um, omission. In, in the Marshall Islands, it isn't just our work. The Department of Energy has been doing work for decades. Um, our work disputes some of what they have been saying, but at least they've been doing something that has not been true. The UK walked away. The, the US essentially said, oh, well, you were, they were a colony of the United Kingdom, so United Kingdom let us test there, so we walked away, and then the UK just walked away. Oh, now you're an independent country. So there's been very, very little work done there. Well, I was wondering what you thought about the proposition that the problem we have is that people don't really have a visceral, embodied sense of what the damage is that these weapons can do, and that how do we convey that message? So John, John is. Uh, let me just share with the because I don't think everyone here can could hear you. So John is asking um, that people don't really have a visceral sense of, of the damage uh, and, and how can that be conveyed. Um, so, you know, part of the reason I think why um, some of these movements were, I would argue, more successful in the 80s, part of the reason was that it was part of the popular culture. The popular culture has sort of given up, you know, we don't have blockbuster movies about this, we don't have, you know, TV shows about it, we don't have, um, uh, we don't have that presence in the mainstream media, don't cover these topics except very, very superficially. The one thing I'm a little bit hopeful about this, there will be a film about Oppenheimer by Chris Nolan coming out on July 21st. 
Um, no one really knows what kind of a take uh, the movie, what sort of a message the movie will, will send. But I think regardless of the message of the movie, I think just getting people's attention on the issue um, will be really important and actually will be an opportunity um, for NAPF and, and other organizations to really kind of get a little bit uh, into the into the broader public. And we're definitely planning, I'm planning some more op-eds, including, and I'll just share with, with this audience here, including the fact that, so with my family, uh, I live in New York City in an apartment that was previously occupied, it's a Columbia University owned apartment, previously occupied by someone named I.I. Robbie. Uh, Robbie was a Nobel laureate in physics who discovered nuclear magnetic resonance, but it turns out Robbie was also a friend of Oppenheimer, even though he didn't work on the Manhattan Project. It was in our apartment, according to both Robbie's and Oppenheimer's biographies, that the two of them, in December of 1945, talked about international control of nuclear weapons. So I'm hoping to, <laughs> to, to sort of send the message that, that ki those kinds of conversations are happening in that same living room um, today. My husband and I talk, Nemanja can attest, talk about this all the time. And we have diplomats over, and we have activists over, and we have students over. So um, that conversation has to be completed once and for all. But thank you for that question. Let's see who else we have. David. Thanks for your very helpful presentation. Uh, my question is, why is gambling with nuclear war and resulting in nuclear winter and the death of uh, five billion people and the end of civilization as we know it acceptable to the U.S., Russian, and Chinese government leaders? Yeah, so David is asking, why is gambling with the future of humanity, why is gambling with something like nuclear winter um, acceptable? It's not. And it's not acceptable to many people. Um, it's just that the people who are making these decisions right now are not, they don't want to hear this. They don't want to know. Um, it's as if they are working for the military industrial complex as opposed to Nemanja's and other children of the world. Um, it is, this is, this really, you know, and, and you won't find the coverage of the latest study on nuclear winter in the mainstream media. You just won't find it. They don't want to tell us this. And it's the truth. This is, this is the truth. So yes, we, we do need, um, we need, I think, we need more people to know about this, first and foremost. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yes, the next hand, I'm sorry, I don't see my, it's so small, I can't see your name. Go ahead, uh, see, see live. Yes, um, most of all, thank you so much for the excellent presentation, very knowledgeable and very informative. <coughs> I have one question. Yes. Uh, my question is about this treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, the PPNW. Um, are United States and Russia signatories or? No, no. So the so so Bly is asking about the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. No nuclear weapon state has signed this treaty. In fact, when it was being negotiated, the United States, with its allies, was outside of the room protesting that, that this was even taking place. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I can't say some, some thing. This is going to be posted as a recording, so there's some. <laughs> I'm trying to check myself and not say too much uh, when it's really out in the public. But um, yeah, no, they're going to they're gonna all have to, they're going to all have to sign. Yes, <laughs> because I told them so. <laughs> right. yeah, unfortunate, but it is what it is. I guess. Yeah, no, they we they has to be. I think it has to be pressure 
So for a country like the United States, what's really important to recognize is that there are authoritarian societies where people are not able to say what I'm saying today, right? Some Russian scientist who's probably wa who may want to say these things is not able to say them, or a Chinese scientist. But it was, Gorbachev was watching what was happening in the Central Park rally. People leading these countries watch what happens in civil society in places like the United States. So because we have the freedom, you know, may not always be worth all that much, but we do have it. Because we have the freedom to say this, it's important that we, we say it, and it's important that we keep saying it. Um, and I actually have much more hope that countries like Russia and North Korea um, would actually be open to this if we were to do the right thing and lead the world. The, these weapons cost so much money just to maintain, let alone everyone's now supposed to modernize them and replace them because they're becoming too old and that's trillions of dollars, literally. Um, and so for, for some of these countries, it would be great to, you know, uh, get that off, off, off their budget. And for us, it would be great to get that money they were spending on this and directed towards um, issues like climate change and pandemics, et cetera. So I'll take one more question from, from online and then we'll have to close. Thank you. I think that's Ernst. Yes, thank you. Uh, I congratulate you for this presentation. Thank you. It's a very insightful presentation. I have one question for you. Yes. You mentioned earlier that uh, the United States should lead by example by being the first to abolish its nuclear weapons. What role do you think American public opinion can play in forcing the government to denuclearize the country? So, so to, to be very clear, I think the United States should set the example and sign the TPNW and then enter a period of negotiations with other countries for having them sign and for how they're all going to come, first come down together and then how they're all going to get to zero. So I'm not recommending that the United States go out and destroy and eliminate all of its 6,000 nuclear weapons where Russia re maintains a 6,000 nuclear weapon arsenal and, and, and so on and so forth. But yes, the general public is gonna have to be more engaged on this. Um, and I, 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 you know, it's not an easy question. It's not one. I was just in a meeting with Richard Falk and a, and a wonderful group of intellectuals from all around the world, and we spent over well over two hours without really a final solution. But but it, part of it has to be the people need to learn about this. That that's that's one part. Part of it it, it has to it has to kind of come from different. Um, uh, different angles and part of it has to also be this pressure from the international, the more countries that join this and say enough is enough, you're putting all of us at risk, the, the, I, the easier it can be. And I, I'll just end on this, that things have happened in, in, in history that people didn't predict. The end of apartheid, the fall of the Berlin Wall. I believe that this is one of those things that we're just going to one day wake up and those weapons are going to be gone. And I hope it's sooner rather than later. So on that note, I'm going to thank our online audience so much. Thank you all so much. And end the meeting and, and thank all of you for being here with us. Um, and, and for those of you who are staying uh, for our evening program of honoring Professor Richard Falk, I'm looking forward to, uh, to, to, to seeing you further. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>